Leslie Meredith with Breakbulk Events and Media. I'm here today with John O'Keefe with Orsted Energy, who will be one of our speakers on our upcoming Breakbulk America's digital special um, on offshore wind projects here in the United States. So it's quite a hot topic these days, and we are really looking forward to this session. So I encourage you to go to the breakbulk.com website and sign up for this one. But in the meantime, we're here to talk to John and get a little preview of what the offshore market looks like and Orsted Energy's involvement with it. So I wanted to start off, John, by um, uh, asking you about a little bit about the company history. You've recently been named um, the most sustainable corporation in the world. Yes, Global 100 Index from Corporate Night. So that's impressive. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so how did the company move from being um, focused primarily on oil and gas, fossil fuels to renewables? Yeah, it's a, a great question, Leslie. I, I, it's pretty pretty interesting to see uh, an oil and gas company or previously oil and gas company make the shift entirely to, to renewables. And Orsted was, you know, a leader and is a leader in, in the offshore wind industry. And they saw this early on. They saw this transition that's going to be necessary. And they decided to, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this right. We're going to do this all the way. And so they see a world that runs runs entirely on green energy. And so, you know, they've made huge strides and huge progress to get the company there and to, to try and get, uh, you know, to get the rest of us there as well. So, you know, great progress being made and we're excited for the future. Yeah, that is so great. And clearly, they, as you say, um, you saw it early. I'm just now, maybe in the last couple of months, seeing some major oil and gas companies divesting some of their maybe underperforming um, assets and moving into renewables. So it's really interesting to see um, Orsted on the forefront here. Yeah, I mean, we're excited about the, the transition. You know, energy transitions historically are not not an easy transition, you know, but we don't see this as, you know, necessarily competition for for other other energy sources and and pushing people out or job loss. We see this as, as an immense opportunity to to do just that, to transition, to take all of that that knowledge out there that and whatever existing resources can be retrofitted to for, for use in offshore wind. You know, we, we have this great workforce and the, these these fleets all around the world. We wanna make sure that we can we can make sure they're all involved in in this in this transition as we go from from fossil fuels to, to renewable energy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would um, tell us a little bit more about utilizing current assets or or assets that were in oil and gas sector now doing you know working towards um the offshore wind sector i don't think most people would understand that that there are assets in place that can be brought to bear on you know a completely different kind of project where where are the overlaps sure yeah that's that, that, that's a great point so when we we look back to Block Island Wind Farm, which shockingly right uh, to me right now is that it was over four years ago that we built uh, the the nation's first offshore wind farm just here in Rhode Island, and in the construction uh, we did look to oil and gas uh, to the existing assets and resources. Some of the labor uh, was used to to build the foundations, and that knowledge and that labor was oil and gas based. So the yeah. foundations that were built uh, at, for Block Island were very similar to oil and gas. And also the vessels that we use. So right now, you know, even, even four years later, we're still in a position where we don't have all, necessarily all of the right vessels that, that are needed in the supply chain. So we make use of what we have. Some vessels are retrofitted, some, some vessels are used in their existing capacity. So just for instance, jack up vessels. Jackup mm -hmm. vessels were in, in integral part of the the Block Island uh, construction process, uh, and and I see jackup vessels uh, from the Gulf being used 
uh, much more in, in in the years to come as well. So that's the I think Jacko vessels is one one of the great assets of uh, of the Gulf that can be used here on the East Coast as we look to build out uh, our portfolio. Yeah, right. Um, so, all right. So we know that Block Island is up and running. What what do we have in the pipeline? Or what so, do you have in the pipeline? <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty exciting pipeline in general. I, if we look to the East Coast uh, of the U.S., you know, it depends on who you ask on what day. So it could be it could be 25 gigawatts, could be 30 gigawatts here in the next um, 20 years, 30 years. So that's a that's a massive amount, especially when you compare it to what currently exists in the water. Um, there's only uh, there's only two small offshore wind farms in the U.S. We have the 30 megawatt megawatt Block Island wind farm, and uh, there's 12 megawatts down for for Seavow off the coast of Virginia, just recently uh, installed, constructed by Orsted and, and owned by Dominion. So that's that's a pretty small uh, sample size, but when we look at the potential along the East Coast, you're talking 25 to 30 gigawatts. That's a huge amount of investment, a huge amount of opportunity for you know, shipping, mariners, uh, and then of course the land-based supply chain. And then when we look at Orsted, you know, we are we are the global leader and we're the US offshore leader as well. We're lucky enough we have we have almost three gigawatts in our pipeline right now to build. And we are we are in various stages of development uh, you know, on all the projects. Uh, and right now we're working our way through the, the federal permitting process. Okay, well, that's great. Listen, can you maybe quantify for us to help those in our industry that are involved in um, the logistics and transportation aspect um, of, of uh, wind projects, how many pieces uh, would, I don't want to say the average project that you're looking at, but let's just say, you know, typical uh, how many pieces of cargo are we looking at and where might they be coming from? It's a great question. So uh, it's a comp, these projects are complex. And as you can imagine, you know, very large scale commercial wind farms require quite a bit of uh, supply chain and quite a bit of moving pieces. So when you look at the major components uh, that are involved in, in an offshore turbine, you have the submarine cables that obviously connect uh, you know, the, the, the towers and the turbines themselves to substations and then, and then back, to the, back to the grid on land. So those are a major component. Then you have the foundations, whether they be monopiles or similar to Block Island or gravity-based, whatever. There's a, several different uh, styles that are in use. So you have the foundation pieces, which are large, uh, and those have to be, to be uh, manufactured and moved. And then you have the tower pieces uh, themselves, you know, big steel pieces that have to be moved. And then you have the nacelles, which where the power is generated, which these days are, are getting bigger and bigger and really exciting stuff that's happening in, in technology. And then the blades, which are uh, probably the, the biggest in terms of size, not in weight, but in size and length. You've got these uh, the t uh, turbine blades that now are, are reaching uh, pretty fantastic uh, sizes and technology. So, all, and then of course, all of the smaller pieces you have, you have cranes for each uh, for, for each uh, location. You have all the different associated pieces that need to go in. So, it's a it's a complicated answer to a to an easy question, but um, you know it's coming coming globally. So what we're seeing now is we're actually got a lot of great uh, activity in the U.S. For, on the supply chain, but of course we need more project certainty to get those those uh, more permanent supply chain solutions. So in the mean, in the interim, you know you are seeing things globally shipped, uh, whether it's from Spain or France or you know wh wherever the uh, uh, the uh, components are sourced from. You know GE uh, General Electric supplied uh, the Block Island wind farm with their turbines, and those came from France, the GE plant in France. So that's that's one, one example. But again, I think what we'll see when we've, what we've already seen, uh, submarine cables, for instance, they've now, uh, there's a submarine cable factory in Charleston, South Carolina, um, that's just recently opened. So that's that's pretty exciting. And there's, 
there's a lot of plans right now for uh, foundations and, and, and for other components to be built here in the U.S., but um, we, have to, we have to get some more of that project certainty before we get there. Right. Um, do you have any idea of the timeline? Uh, timelines are kind of tough to, to to speak to right now, um, given the given the permitting uh, the permitting timelines. But uh, right now, what I could say for Orsted's projects, we're looking uh, probably around 2022 for, mm -hmm. for real major construction activity. Okay, interesting. Um, and then let's let's look forward. Um, these projects are all located on the East Coast that Orsted's involved in. In the future, do you think we'll see offshore wind um, constructed in other waters, maybe the West Coast or the Gulf or even the Great Lakes? Yeah, absolutely, I, I do. I think right now the main focus and thrust is on the East Coast because of, uh, you know, we call it the trifecta for, for, for development, right? You've got You've got the right water depths. You've got shallow water depths on the outer continental shelf. You've got a huge demand in the energy corridor from DC up up to Boston, and then you've got you you uh, put that with the wind speed that is uh, present off the East Coast. It's 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 the Saudi Arabia of offshore wind. Uh, yes, we, I like we, that. <laughs> so it you know the, the East Coast right now is very very attractive for for offshore wind development. But that being said, you know, you look out to California now why they're a bit behind and we're all, you know, frankly, in the U.S. a bit behind, uh, but we're catching up. And I know we're going to we're going to catch up quickly when we look to the West Coast or the Gulf. If you look at deeper water, there are solutions now that are that are being used commercially that are commercially viable uh, in the floating sector. Um, you know, that I say those are a bit behind, uh, you know, fixed platforms. But, but they are coming along. And so when we look to California, you have that incredible energy demand on the West Coast as well. You also have uh, excellent wind speeds. You just, you have that added challenge with the water depth, but that challenge can be absolutely be met. And then you, you throw in the Gulf Coast as well. I think people overlook the Gulf right now, um, probably just because traditionally of all the oil and gas activity, but there is tremendous opportunity in the Gulf as well. So I think, you know, as developers, you know, gain ground and momentum and, in the U.S., and we start to see uh, more projects being built and and more energy being delivered by offshore wind. As we've seen in Europe, you know, they, they, we're going to see more and more projects and more and more solutions come online. Excellent. That sounds all very promising, and um, we will certainly look forward to hearing more from you uh, during the digital special on uh, U.S. offshore wind. That will be, let me take a look, that'll be Tuesday on November 3rd at 11.30 a.m. That's Central Time, Houston Time. So um, our, let's see, later for you. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a little so late, yeah. Bad. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I'm on the oh, East Coast. I'm so Island. bad at time zones. But yeah, that's, it's going to be, it's going to be very exciting. And I think certainly renewables, I've heard this from basically everyone I've talked to in the industry lately, renewables is the bright spot at this point in time. And if anything, I think the pandemic and oil price drop, et cetera, has just helped propel that forward. So good time for you. Hey, listen, you know, it's, it's tough times for all, but we see, you know, again, we see Offshore wind is, you know, a really excellent example of how we can invest and build and get and get jobs, get people back to work, and get you know get our shipyards working, get our mariners working, and and it, I think it's a an excellent solution. And you know, it's not the only solution, but it is a solution that can work. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, and we will see you in just a few weeks. Great. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you.